I'm Bernard Johnson, the Group Managing Director, and uh, I'm presenting the, res the interim results for our company, which I think is a fast-growing 30 million turnover company with aspirations to get to 60 million fairly quickly, probably in the next three years, with a combination of organic growth and acquisition. And just to emphasize the growth side of it, uh, last year we grew by 50 percent with the help of an acquisition, but the underlying organic growth was around 15%. In the last six months, our organic order intake growth was just under 14% on a like-for-like -like basis. So we have some room to be optimistic. I think we're on the right track and we want to keep going. There's no, no signs of anything that would stop us continuing that, on that track for the foreseeable future. To gain that growth, we haven't sacrificed margins. Our margin has actually grown by 4%. We're up from uh, over 42% from 41.3, I think, last year. And that's down to the fact that we probably sell in dollars. We, we're a dollar seller. We have good, a good buying team, and we're moving up the, the chain in terms of our product, moving from value products right up into the premium sector. We've just launched Feather and Down, we have one or two others in the pipeline. So that, that should continue as well. So, so we've got stability and strength and we've got positive growth. And I feel that's down to the strength of our management team, uh, both at the senior level and middle management level. We spend a lot of time on that, on training people, on bringing in new blood and making sure they fit in with our culture. And that seems to have worked successfully and we intend to continue that for the foreseeable future. We also, as Pippa will point out, Pippa's our group marketing and sales director, she will emphasize our unique position in the marketplace, how we've managed to get there, and how we intend to spin off that and continue with that uniqueness. Um, we have a, a global reach, which continues to expand. <coughs> our export is doing very well. Outside of the European Union, that is, which is probably a good thing right at this minute in time, but we intend to focus on Germany in the next year or two and, and build up our, our presence there. Our challenge will be to maintain our manufacturing capacity in line with our sales growth. To be honest, our sales are, have outstripped even our expectations and uh, we've now got to work very hard at uh, improving our manufacturing capacity to keep pace with that. Uh, and we intend to do that over the next 18 months by buying equipment and installing it and um, using it to um, double our capacity in the same uh, premises so that our, our, our site, which is about 110,000 square feet, will be able to cope with a 60 million turnover um, and still have spare capacity. At the moment, we're squeezed, so we, we will be investing something around 800,000 in terms of high-speed machinery, which will be much more efficient and much easier maintained. Well, that's what they said on the brochure anyway. So um, that's our, our um, aim. So that's my introduction. Uh, Paul Foster, our Finance and Commerce Director, will take you through our financials, and then Pippa will follow that with um, some interesting stuff on our marketing and sales. Um, straight from the results announced this morning is the top line figures we've got there. Um, revenue growth of 7% in the period. Um, coming through, a lot of that, I'll talk a little bit later, has been in the last three months of the year. We've got an operating margin that's up 0.7%, up to 5.8%, um, which is significant growth. Um, again, I'll talk a little bit to that later. The profit before tax up 21%. That's giving us a profit after, uh, before tax of 956,000. Earnings per share, 0.9%. So all positive figures. Taxes are partly driven that down from the before tax profit figure and then a return on capital employed of 10.7% on the six month figures compared to 9.5% last year um, and we've slightly modified that calculation from previous years to tie in with the figures the the calculation adopted by the stock exchange so it's consistent with that going forward and for the first time ever we've de decided the board last week to um, pay an interim dividend of 0.15 pence per share and um, that compares to the 0.23 percent pence per share final dividend we did last year so we've um, made an in, a, a commitment really to shareholders to start uh, sharing some of those successes just going through the detail 
The bottom half is the first six months. The top half of this graph is the, um, is the second half for last year. And you can see the revenue um, has grown, the big growth again in 2016. 2016-17, uh, as Bernard mentioned, relating to the uh, growth on the assets we acquired in February 2016. But again, the revenue's grown by 7%. I think we'll go on a little bit more, but within our own brands, some of the brands you see around here today, that growth has outstripped um, the underlying growth of 12%. And, and that growth has been significantly biased towards the last three months of the year. Um, and that impacts on some of the working capital uh, commitments we've had to make in the business um, that will, you will have seen from the figures. Again, operating profits, this is before tax and interest. Um, we're looking at a 21% increase in operating profits. So the 7% growth in sales has been leveraged through to a 21% growth in profits. Our gross margin, Bernard mentioned, 42.1% is up 1.1% on last year. Um, a combination of reins, sales mix, higher higher priced products into more away from the discount end of the market. Export sales have grown in the period. Again, we get a higher margin from that and a little bit of customer mix, as well as a significant benefit from, we're starting to reap the benefit from the um, consolidated purchasing we've been able to do following the acquisition. So we've, um, particularly on raw materials, we had a program to amalgamate sources of supply um, and, and generate income from the economies of scale that's given us, and that's starting to flow through in the period. So there's a whole number of factors that helped us drive that margin forward. Um, costs have gone up, particularly administration costs, but they're in line with the anticipated growth we've got in the business. Distribution costs as a ratio are, have fallen. Again, is a little bit as you expect the economic economies of scale throwing through the business. So all in all, you know, a significant, you know, twenty-one percent growth in profit from the um, from the seven percent growth in sales. Rather than two profit figures, just look at the margins. Um, 5.8% increase in operating margin, 5.1% uh, last year. So that 0.7% was in the 1.1% on the gross margin starting to flow through into the bottom line. Corporation impact is we're paying a full year tax charge this year and we have a prior year adjustment that's in the tax charge that we've taken the full hit in the first six months of the year that's impacted on the tax charge in these accounts. The uh, rate of tax that you see in these figures will actually be decreased once we come through to the full year marginally as that the impact of that prior year adjustment is um, spread across the figures. So we will see that um, tax rate being a more normal level as we go forward. Um, and we've still got a little bit of the benefit of those synergies coming through in the overheads and administrations that we had in the first half of, of last year. Return on capital employed, as I mentioned, we've sort of adopted the stock exchange model to give a consistent measure. This gave us a calculation of 10.7% on the six months. Continued growth, um, probably a little bit higher than we anticipated, but it does give us, um, you know, it, it gets us well on the way to our aspiration that we're looking at uh, for a 20% return on capital employed on the, full, on the full year's figures. And then the diluted earnings per share, again, the graphs are all going the right way, an increase of 9% and 400% since, since four years ago, those comparative figures. Cash uh, needs a bit of more explanation. Um, the, the cash at the end of the year is slightly lower than it was at the equivalent time last year. Our sales are up, our stocks and debtors are up as a consequence of that. Um, so that definition is all of the cash in the business, whether it's short term or long term. So it's a, a 250,000 overdraft uh, negative at that point in time. And the working capital is the main reason for that deterioration from, uh, Mar from September and the slight deterioration year on year. And the final dividend, obviously, is the first time we've ever paid that. That went through in the period at 139,000. So that's the first time we've distributed anything out of profits. And I just wanted to talk about the working capital um, just to give you a bit of a feel. We're looking at um, stocks up by 1.2 million in that um, yeah, compared to September last year. Um, the stock turn figure comes out roughly looking on the forward sales forecast the same. And we're looking at a sales forecast in the third quarter that's 24% um, higher than last year. And we're preparing and building stock in order to meet that. Uh, that demand um, and 
looking at the other thing that's tied up cash is the debtors. And in the last two months, we're looking at 59 debtor days of the same year on year. But in the last two months, our sales are 24% higher than last year, and that's driven that. And there's a little bit of sales mix in there. Um, again, export has a little bit more um, uh, longer terms than our normal UK business, so as that grows. And one particular customer has significant debtor days. <laughs> um, but um, the, 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 so, so the, the, what I'm trying to get across here is that um, the, 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 the working capital increase has good supportable reasons and the reasons are the higher sales in the last two months of the year and the cash will flow through in the next few months and the investment in stock to support the forecast in the next three months. Um, Credits days are roughly the same, 48, 49 days are the same as last year. So we've not used our creditors other than the increased activity to, to support that. Bernard mentioned moving on to sort of some of the operational aspects away from the finances here. Um, Bernard mentioned about plans for growth. Um, we have, that, that's, uh, as Bernard alluded to there, the, the sales order intake in those last three months came quicker than we anticipated and has stretched um, some of our resources. We work, um, our factory main, all, all of the production lines, so about 13 production lines roughly on a day shift and about seven on a late shift. So we have increased capacity going forward by increasing the number of lines we run on the late shift and we could go to a night shift. But what we've chosen to do is to continue with our programme of centres of excellence, so moving production capabilities between the two sites to maximise the use of equipment there. And that will involve moving underutilised equipment uh, into Peterborough to cope with the expansion. We're going to expand the second shift in, P in Peterborough and we're already on the process there of recruiting the resources in terms of the engineers and the quality control and, um, and the supervision to require to support that. Um, and we're also focusing much more on equipment utilisation so, so that we are managing capacity rather than efficiency, if you like, a slightly different emphasis in terms of utilising the equipment in the factory. Um, so there's a fair bit going in onto the operational and organisational side of the business. We're also looking at a more senior operational manager to come into the Peterborough site to, to look after the day-to-day -day and their recruitment's ongoing for that. On the capital side, we're looking at over two years, looking at two high-speed bottle filling lines that will double the output of the two main lines in Peterborough. We've got three bottle filling lines there that they'll be increased. We're also looking at a high-speed tube filling line. That will probably increase about 25% the machine outputs, but running it on double shifts will give us an, an increased capacity. So it's may, it, both of those will be aimed at maintaining our flexibility because we have to be all things to all people in terms of um, what we can offer. We, we, we can't automate fully and have a fully automated bottle line and then Tesco don't want the bottle that we've just invested all the money in. So we have to keep a flexibility in our manufacturing process. But there are areas we can look at to increase the speed and the output and reduce the unit cost, the labour unit cost as we go ahead. Um, and we're also utilising some equipment from Devon and modifying it going to increase and automate the um, the jar filling operation in Peterborough. So there's a number of tasks that are going to go on. Some of these will, you know, with the lead times on the equipment, will start flowing in, in the, towards the end of the spring next year. Um, but we'll get the full benefit of these in um, the next financial year. And it'll give us that platform to double the output from the sort of, sort of you know, annualised 37, 38 million we're dealing with at the moment to in the last couple of months um, to the um, 60 million aspirational figure. Just wanted to put those la all of that in the context of we talked about last last time our aspirations. These are not changed. Um, double the turnover. Well, we're, we're on. You know that was always um, a mixture of organic and acquisition. Um, the organic growth is coming through. Um, we're still hunting for an acquisition, so all all, all um, ideas are welcome. Um, show at least net profit, that was after tax. We talked about 5%, we achieved 4.8% in this six month. Um, that would have been closer to 6% with a, a, a more normal tax. Pay a dividend of 2%. Ooh, um, we, we we're on track, we're paying, the divid uh, paying an interim dividend. Um, the share price has moved since we made that aspiration, so we've still got a few, a bit, a bit, a bit, of, uh, bit of progress to go. But the return on capital employed of 20%, um, we're well on track to achieving that. 
Um, and as Bernard, we're increasing the team, we're developing the team internally, so we're still pro keeping our focus on increasing the, the strength of the team, developing people within the business and where we need to recruit the external people. Okay, hand over to Pippa who will do the interesting bit. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. We are fortunate that we continue to trade in a market which is in dynamic growth both globally and even more so in the UK. Um, almost 300 billion globally, 5% growth predicted between now and 2020. UK market is forecasted to exceed that, um, which is quite exciting. It's predominantly coming from the premium space, particularly skincare. Um, UK market is currently trading about 16 billion, so about 5.5% of the global market. Um, and so very fortunate, we're in a very dynamic category which continues to give us lots of different opportunities. Um, key things in the context of where we're operating to note is that much like is happening in grocery and with grocery shop and the weekly shop, behaviour is changing. Consumers, particularly female, um, their shopping habits are changing in beauty. They're moving into the discounters, they're moving online, they're moving to speciality retailers. Um, so that is a very interesting dynamic in our business and one that we need to evolve and, and keep an eye on. Um, that is also allowing more independent brands to come to market successfully because they don't need to come through the traditional channels anymore. They can launch with the likes of the Hut Group, which is lookfantastic.com or Feel Unique, um, and they can get quite good presence and quite good following with consumers without having to tackle the likes of a Boots or a Superdrug and everything that brings with it. So the whole industry is just very exciting for us in terms of the growth that's there, but also in terms of how the dynamics are changing. Who are Crichtons? We hold what we feel to be a very unique position in the UK in that we are central to the personal care and beauty industry here in the UK. And the reason that we have that position is because of the breadth and the depth of the product offer and the customer base that we have. So we have three key trading divisions, contract manufacturing, private label, where we work direct with retailers, and then our own brands that we own. We continue to be consumer focused in all three of those divisions. So even when we are manufacturing for somebody else's brand, we stay very close to the consumer that they are selling that product to. In terms of our customer breadth, we trade from Poundland to Harvey Nichols. Um, you will see products that we own and products that we manufacture in all of those retailers throughout the UK. And in fact, just to give you a, a, a live example of that, if you were to walk into Harvey Nichols Knightbridge, Knightsbridge today and relook at their merchandising sets, there's a beautiful new display on the back wall in Health and Beauty of three key brands that they've just launched. And that's Eccentric Molecule, the fragrance brand, Clive Christian, one of the most expensive fragrance brands in the world, and Floral Street, which is the new fragrance launch from Michelle Feeney. And we manufacture and have developed those brands with those three brand owners, which to walk into Harvey Nichols and to see those three brands on display was quite exciting for me and the marketing team to see. So that's just a practical example of how, you know, the breadth of what we do. And then to add to that, in terms of our central position, we manufacture a broad range of health, personal care and beauty products from talc in the baby market through to premium skincare. And that gives us a lot of opportunity in terms of understanding the market, having category expertise and providing our customers with different options on products that they might like to provide to their end consumer. The benefits that this structure of breadth and depth in our business brings us is what we feel is the USP and the unique positioning of our business here in the UK market. Because we manufacture for brands, we look after our own brands that we own, and we work very closely with all the big multiple retailers in the UK, the insight and intelligence that we have into the personal care and beauty market in the UK, I would say is relatively unique. Not only can I see the plans and the goals and the objectives of what's happening with the major retailers in the health and beauty category, I can also see what's happening with the brands that we're manufacturing for in terms of the products that are selling for them, new innovations that they're bringing to market, and what's happening with their, if you like, their futures and their successes. Um, in addition to obviously the work that we do with our own brands in terms of buying research and formulating what we think is going to be you know, a great seller and meet consumer needs. It also gives us an advantage with regard to innovation and agility. So again, that insight into the total market 
allows us to keep ahead of the market in terms of trend, use multiple resources in terms of understanding what's going on, and then to adapt ourselves with the three different areas that we have and the multiple categories and the multiple customer base that we have to take advantage of different things. So an example would be clay. That's a brand new launch that we've done literally in the past two months. We've already sold 30,000 units in about six weeks sales just through one retailer. And that was an example where L'Oreal have already bought clay to the market at the mass level, but there was definitely an opportunity in the value position to take advantage because they priced the product quite high for mass. So there was definitely a price opportunity if we were to deliver a good performance product in the value position and take advantage of that. Um, and we got that to market in four months. So it was a very quick reaction to a trend that was happening and the sales are coming through too. So that's a, a good example of where innovation and agility and insight allows us to move. And then also it gives us flexibility and scale. So again, examples of that would be, you know, we are manufacturing volumes, volume manufacturing in products for someone like Asda Baby. We manage their Little Angels private label brand. It's the second largest baby brand after J&J &J in the UK in volume terms. And then we'll be making for someone like Clive Christian that is a high-end fragrance retailing for 1,500 pounds. And we're making anything from three to 400 units to satisfy what they need. So again, having those three divisions, having the breadth of customers that we have and the different categories allows us to have what we feel is this central position in the UK market and also one that is quite unique. So for those of you that had the presentation before, you would have seen this slide before. We don't define ourselves as a manufacturer. We have a mindset that we're a solution provider to the market. And this has enabled us to take the insights that we get, take all of the innovation and trends that we get and to apply it to what our customers need. So how we approach business coming on or business that we're going after is we will look at the retailer and the gap that they may have in the market or we'll look at the brand that we're working for and we always sit down and, and, and work out what value can we add to them in terms of driving their business forward and ultimately what does their consumer want. And in order to do that, we have this mindset that we're a solution provider. Again, it's about the breadth and depth of the teams that we have, not just in terms of marketing and sales, but also in terms of the buying powers that we have, in terms of our MPD teams, um, in terms of research and development to allow us to look at those propositions that customers bring us or that we may be proactively going after them so that we're always working on a basis of where can we add value. And that also enables us to develop more longer term relationships with our customers as well. So by having that mindset of being a solution provider, it's allowed the journey that we've been through over the past, well, it's over 10 years now, um, to diversify and if you like, to a certain degree, de-risk our business by moving quite significantly the brands that we have, the number of brands that we have, the number of customers that we have from one dominant customer to multiple customers, to different channels, from discount to mass to premium, um, and from expanding into export markets as well. So again, the whole team back at base in Peterborough and Devon have this, um, the way that we approach business as a solution provider has allowed us to, to go on this journey. In terms of where we're at currently, in terms of business mix by division type, contract manufacturing, we had a, a big bounce in contract manufacturing last year when we acquired the assets of Broad Oak Toiletries. We were able to go and get all of those customers um, that were being supplied by Broad Oak Toiletries and they were contract in their definition. Um, so the contract manufacturing division um, has currently grown in terms of its total percentage of our business over private label and owned brands. But in line with Bernard and Paul saying that the past two to three months have shifted, it has shifted insofar as that private label has accelerated considerably over the past three months. And actually, if I was to do those numbers as of the moving forward for the next three months, the balance would change insofar as the contract manufacturing comes down to about 38% and private label bounces up. So actually it's heading towards something that we're more comfortable with, which is actually having a third, a third, a third in terms of balancing our business with the different divisions. In terms of customer type, um, so that's extended in terms of who we're dealing with, prestige brands being something that's entered for us over the past two to three years, now represents 30% of our customer types. Um, with export at 
In terms of categories, and again alluding to this unique position we have in the UK, this isn't all the categories that we deal in because there is an other there. And in that other, there's probably about six different categories, which includes things like foot care, self-tan, and a number of others. But in terms of the main contributing categories, skin care is a third of what we do, hair care, bath and body being also the big ones, fine fragrance being a new one that's come over the past 18 months to two years, um, and baby still playing quite a key role in terms of what we do. So to layer on top of the mindset that we're a solution provider and this unique position we have in the UK, one of the results for us is the awards that we win, both from consumers and both from retailers. Quality service and innovation is a key mantra within our business. And for us, awards are a part of, if you like, the results and a demonstration that we are focusing on quality service and innovation. So in addition to product award there, you will see that we have quality service and innovation awards with some key retailers in the market, which is absolutely essential to keeping those retailers happy and keeping those relationships moving forward. Um, the key one for us this year in 2017 is we were voted by Superdrug as supplier of the year. So that was a big one because you've got P&G and L'Oreal and Unilever and all the titans of this industry in the, in the room, along with some smaller <laughs> manufacturers like us. And that really was on the basis of the growth that we've had with them, the innovation that we've taken them, and that we do have an excellent 99% service record with them in terms of our order delivery. So again, just focusing on the quality service and innovation piece, which is very important, is the consumer feedback that we get. It's a constant cycle for us of ensuring that feedback from consumers on our brands or brands that we manufacture for are coming to us so that we can act upon it. Um, and I put this one up just because they're just some of the most fantastic feedback we've had in the past three or four months with regard to Feather and Down, people describing it as sleep in a bottle, which I couldn't have made that up if I tried. I mean, I thought that was just a great definition of what's going on there. So um, consumer feedback, very important to our process of continuing to innovate. And then innovation being the third pillar. Um, these are examples of where we have been first to market with different types of ranges in different categories. That's very important to keeping us ahead of the market. Um, without a doubt, brands that we manufacture for recognize this in us and often come to us to help them work up very innovative products to help their brands move forward. So the recognition of us doing it with our own brands also has a spin-off into the rest of our business, as well, of course, with the uh, retailers in private label. I mean, a good example of that is our business with Aldi over the past six months has grown exponentially. When Paul highlighted that our sales growth has come quicker than we thought, Aldi has been key to that. The onshoring that they're doing from, particularly from the German manufacturing market into the UK is significant. We knew that was coming. It's just come at a pace that I didn't quite anticipate. Um, they are moving very quickly as they do. Um, and one of the ways that we got Aldi's attention was that we took some very innovative products to them. Um, so you may have seen, because they do these big special buys, there was a hot cloth cleanser recently that we did that was very successful, and we also did a Glam Glow mask type for them as well. Um, and that's how we managed to get um, an audience with Aldi to start with, was about the innovation in terms of the products that we do, which is now moving into consistent supply of some of their core ranges. So it has worked, which has been quite exciting. So innovation for us, very important in terms of keeping the whole momentum moving in terms of ensuring that our brands are ahead of the market and delivering the consumer something that they want to buy, but also the spin-off that we get into the other categories that we supply. So to conclude, the journey continues. Um, continuous momentum and growth, that is definitely something that we have experienced in the business over the past year, and that is continuing. Paul has given you an insight into how the third quarter is looking in terms of what the sales book is looking like. Um, that has also meant that we've got a much more improved profile in the marketplace. Um, for those of you that have been to these presentations previously, you know that up until the past year or so, we've, we've kept our heads under the radar. Um, by, by kind of getting the momentum and growth and, and what's coming through the business, it's improving our profile in the marketplace, which is having a spin-off on the brands that are coming to us and the retailers that we're working with. Um, which is very interesting in terms of, again, de-risking the business and moving into different categories. Increasing brand visibility and recognition. Um, another piece of good news over the past six months is Crichton's hair care position in terms of market share. So based on IRI data to the end of August 2017, 
Crichton's has moved up half a percent in market share in the hair care market in the UK. We are now one of the top 15 volume brands in hair care in the UK market. We're shifting nine and a half million units. Still not on the value <laughs> register yet, because most of what we sell is at a pound. But what's quite exciting about all of that is that the hair care market is actually in decline by 2.5%. We are one of only four brands in the top 15 that are on the increase in the hair care market in the UK. So all of the big boys, including L'Oreal, Herbal Essences, Pantene, Head & Shoulders, Garnier are all in decline in hair care in the UK market. Ourselves, with a couple of other disruptor brands in the market, are moving forward, which I think is really quite exciting. And for me, what that means is that we are delivering what the consumer wants. We're delivering at a price point, we're delivering performance, and we're delivering quality, mm -hmm. and bringing innovation to the market, like clay. We have another one coming out in another month, um, which keeps the market moving. So brand visibility and recognition in terms of the Crichton's corporate brand name is definitely improving and increasing. New products, new customer types and new channels, that is definitely the goal as the journey continues. Feather and Down is going on to QVC in the next couple of weeks, as is Emma Bridgewater, which is one of the brands that we license. So QVC has been a goal for us over the past year, so we're very excited about that. We are also now talking to um, a lot of e-tailers in terms of getting our brands Onto, onto, the, um, onto their space. And moving into other types of retail as well, um, I probably mentioned um, when we did our presentation some months ago, how Primark are really taking a very serious market share in the health and beauty industry. And we've worked very closely with them in terms of making that happen. Um, and that's an example of a, a different type of retailer that's, that's taking advantage of the growth and the opportunities in, in health and beauty. And then as Paul just highlighted at the end of his, we have an appetite for acquisitions. We are definitely on the search for um, brands. Um, the ideal for us would be to be in the premium space and skincare would probably be at the top of the list in terms of the types of brands that we'd, we'd be interested in acquiring. But that would also apply to premium hair care and a couple of other categories as well. Um, so yes, all ideas welcomed in terms of what, what might be out there. So thank you very much. And hopefully there's some time for some questions. Uh, John Cummins, WH Ireland. Um, just a, a couple of questions. Um, just firstly, in terms of the revenue growth uh, that you delivered, could you just expand in terms of, I mean, you mentioned um, Aldi, but just roughly how that's split between new customers uh, compared to existing customers ordering more? Um, the, the key growth in, if I look at private label, it's come for two existing customers and two newer customers. So it's about 50-50, so again, that's quite exciting. In terms of our branded customers, where we've seen 12% growth in branded, that has come from existing and new. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And, and just, uh, I think l last year we saw uh, the operating margin in the second half was, was lower than the first half. Is, that a, is there a structural reason for that? I mean, is that something that we should expect going forward to see that? Um, some of the operating margin in this period comes from uh, um, uh, big volumes that we do that's associated with uh, um, uh, uh, Christmas for the customers. It's seasonal. Um, so um, I would expect a slight, I, I expect that to be partly structural, yes. Thank you. Yeah, if I remember correctly, I think last year you saw of your sales growth, it was driven by um, your own labels and. Um, and contract, but private label was declining. This time you seem to say yes. private label is growing. Is that deliberate or is that just natural volatility? It, it, part, both. So the bounce that we got from contract manufacturing was through the asset buy that we did from Broadoak Toiletries. They were all contract customers. We went out and grabbed all of the customers that we could get back for that business. Didn't know whether or not they would be good business or great margin business, some nice <laughs> names for sure, and definitely premium positions. So when we absorbed that into our business and started working with those customers, some of those have not delivered what we would want them to deliver. And obviously working with those customers, it hasn't necessarily delivered the margins we would want. So there's been a small process of kind of rationalization, if you like, shifting to ensure that we're keeping the contract business that is good contract business and not that that, that is not going to deliver the margin. Um, saying that, there's three brand new contract customers that we've brought to the party over the past 12 months that are as a result of us having those assets that we bought and also being a player now in that premium space. So that's quite exciting for the future. 
Private label, we knew that there would be a turnaround at some point. I've been doing this for about 25 years and I've seen, I've been in private label from the day that it started in the UK and it's very cyclic with the retailers depending on their objectives. Sometimes they have more brands, sometimes they have more private label. There is a private label for sure at the moment kind of wind behind most of these retailers. Um, they've, they're, they're fed up with fighting on brand prices all the time and realise that they can deliver some exclusivity and deliver some differentiation by going back into private label. And that's where we are very well positioned to do that for them. And then there's the Aldi dimension where they're bring, onshoring from Europe in terms of manufacturing, which is, you know, as a direct result of Brexit. So some of it definitely planned in terms of margin mix and margin management, if you like, in terms of having the right kind of customers. And then some of it through the objectives, if you like, of some of these major retailers in terms of their private label agendas. Retailers have learned to relaunch and, and change their product, um, change the fragrances every three or four months, okay, yeah. more intense. We're better, uh, better positioned to do that for them. So we find we're getting more business on that basis in private label. Just, just following on from that, if you look at, a, say, a three-year view, where would you see the split of business between those contract, private and own? And then what can you sort of give us a uh, guidance on? Well, we wrote it down on a piece of paper, so <laughs> give you the same. What, what's the sort of... Did I tell you how dynamic the beauty industry is and how much it's changing all the time? Um, <laughs> and and sorry, just, just the margin architecture in each. If yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of the split on the revenue streams, we would like to keep it balanced. I mean, I think... And a private label is a good is a good example. To a certain extent, you're running with the, the big retailer's agenda. So to a certain extent, it goes in waves. So could I predict what their agenda will be in, in three years' time? I don't think I could. I think pri you know, private label will always be there, but in what state, I don't know. Um, I mean, obviously, our goal in terms of what we can control is to go after more brands and the right brands in terms of contract manufacturing. So I don't see any reason why that wouldn't continue to play a very important role. And then obviously there's our brands and they continue to grow. So I'm not really answering the well, question well, specifically. <laughs> well, I, I think it should be, you know, it, it ideally it would be 20, 20, 20 if we were at 60 million in three years time. But the, the yeah. point is we're competitive. It's out there to be taken and we love to compete. We do love to compete, and we compete in-house as well. So the private label team want to beat the contract team, and it's there for the take. And we, we, we are continually improving our, our offering. You've had some very good success with the Crichton's brand itself. Could you give us a little bit of an idea as to the diversity of the retail space that you're actually getting into, i.e., you know, are you bridging architecture out into, from premium all the way down to value, or is, it, is the emphasis all moving up? Uh, it's a combination. It definitely is moving up, um, but we are also taking advantage of growth in the value sector as well. Both of these are two new brands, or that's an extension to the hair care, and we've just launched the men's that have gone into the value space and doing very well. Um, Feather and Down is a Crichton's brand, and obviously price position goes into boots, so it's in a different space in terms of that, and then onto QVC. And then we've got Crichton's Professional as a branding, where we have the Curl Company, for example, which is a more premium hair care brand. Um, and more coming out in Crichton's Professional over the next six months, so that will be quite interesting. So absolutely, still taking very much advantage of the value space with Crichton's, and we'll continue to do that. That is good, fast volume business, um, and it improves the profile of the brand all the time, but just because of the sheer volumes that we can sell in that space. It brings lots of cost advantages to our business. I mean, nine million tubes a year, <laughs> The spin-off that we get in private label tubes that we buy or contract tubes that we buy because of our purchasing power and raw materials. But very much moving the Crichton's brand into the mass space and the premium space. So you'll now find all of our Crichton's hair care in Tesco, in Asda, in Wilkinson's, in the mass retailers, not just the value retailers. Um, and then with the export, with different markets in export, Crichton's is, is taking different positionings depending on the local market. So Germany is very much like the UK market. It's very value and discount driven. So the retails on our products probably aren't going to be that much different. Um, whereas somewhere like Australia, um, business that we're doing in South America, you know, what we sell for a pound in terms of retail here in the UK is the equivalent of 3 99 and 4 99 in those markets. So it's, 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 very, it's a very dynamic industry beauty in terms of price position. But yeah, definitely, definitely moving up. Okay. Yeah, just, just a very yeah. quick thing on that is the premium stuff we, invent, we develop ourselves, that's our own creation on the more tighter margin uh, Crichton's. It's driven by the discounters and the value uh, uh, retailers who want the product and are following a trend. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then just a question, actually leading into this, what you're saying about volume. 
um, you know, you're, you're dealing with Aldi now and you've got other, you know, high volume retailers. I mean, perhaps you've been dealing with some of these guys before. Is one of the constraints you've got in the production around actually volume for some of these individual lines or is it more about capacity just for the for the across all, across the no, piece it's a general capacity um, issue and uh, and because the lines are very flexible sorry I'll, the lines are very flexible so we can do um, we, we, we can and deliberately so so we can manufacture the range of products that we do to the range of customers we do from small volume to high volume but what we have recognized is there's more high volume lines going through the business and that's one of the reasons for looking at the, the, the more automated process. The 250 mil tubes that we do, uh, Pippa mentioned, that, 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 that one size is now sort of 60% of our tube business. So we can now look at, because we've got that, the higher speed, the more automated tube filling lines, which is what we're looking at. When we're looking at the capacity and high speed on the bottle filling lines, we're looking at flexibility there. It still has to be something that can accommodate different shapes and sizes and caps and what that the, that the market demands of us. So we're looking at a more <laughs> higher speed, but using pucks to stabilise the product and drive the output speeds, just but still keep flexibility in there. So, so it's it, it, you know it's trying to adapt to, never, to the circumstance. Never turn a customer down. So, if we have a capacity problem, we'll, we'll um, subcontract out our branded product, and we have been doing that to, to some extent, which means as soon as we get this new machinery in, we can improve the margin. Again, had we had this machinery in this six months, that margin would have improved. But we won't ever lose a customer or an order because we haven't got the capacity. But we'll put it on our shifts if we have to. Hi. Um, given the um, range of customers and products you have, you probably have, you know, a pretty good overview of the end user, of the consumer. I, I, is there, um, you know, is, are there any particular segments feeling the pinch? Where are retailers having to give more margin away? Where, where, where's the competition coming in there? Um, it depends on the category. <laughs> Bearing in mind, health and beauty is a big category. So bath and shower at the commodity end is definitely feeling the pinch um, insofar as that the grocers are just price fighting all the time and the brands are playing in that space now. You know, so you've got brands that customs bought like Original Source, which was a nice mid-tiered brand when they bought it, selling for four ninety nine, and now you can buy it everyday price 99p. So, you know, you've got Radox that are down, down in that pound space now. So the bath and shower at that kind of what I call almost the commodity end of the market is definitely under pressure. Um, not a space that we play in a huge amount, which is good news. Um, skincare is obviously one that is, I've highlighted before, is definitely a winner in terms of what's happening, both at the mass level, but also at the premium level. Um, consumers are spending more on skincare. Um, they're willing to spend more on skincare and retailers are offering more choice on skincare. So that's a good one. Fragrance is another good one. Um, fragrance did see deflation when it was all about celebrities and having a name on the on the product. So whether it's Katie Price's or Beyonce's or whoever, that whole sector is kind of nosedive now. The consumer has changed completely. They're looking for something very different, very customised. I mean, it is not unusual now. The average spend on fragrance has moved from about forty-five pounds up to seventy-five pounds. You would have seen Tom Ford's new launch. He's launched his fragrance out at 120 pounds. You know, and that's sitting in boots and it's sitting in super drug. And, you know, so it's the dynamics completely changed. There were certain categories, fragrance and um, skincare. And I'm not going to talk about color cosmetics because we don't do it. So, yeah. but that's an interesting yeah. one. Yeah, so could you just talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, when you're actually installing the new machines? And, and sorry, something that's really obvious, but you guys are a, a well-oiled machine. So how, how do you ensure it doesn't affect productivity at all? Well, we always plan around. I mean, we've got a tube machine going out for overhaul in two weeks. We planned that for a long time. We built stock ahead of it. So, so we know that um, when we're doing this, we're planning capacity. Um, we just uh, restructured our engineering team and allocated one of the engineers to project manage all of these over the next, one of the more senior guys, to project manage that because we know we've got a lot coming in the next two years. So, so we've increased the resources um, uh, and, and we typically will plan around um, uh, the, the capacity downtime, so we have a relatively sophisticated capacity planner that we yeah, can we simulate it. Contract out the, the branded yeah. product because that's our brand, and we can use whatever manufacturer. We may have to take a less margin, but we'll do that. And so, so one final thing: you said if, if obviously, if, if you um, had the machines, uh, margin would have been higher in the past six months. Past six months, yeah. could you comment on, on what that that could have been? Wish I hadn't had said that. No. I, um, <laughs> 
Well, no, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, we, we've got such a huge increase in the order intake, um, and we are farming out some production ourselves. Uh, when you, uh, if I could put it, when you operate at 60% uh, uh, capacity or 40% spur capacity, it's, you, you switch people to different lines when things go down. When you're at 100% capacity and something goes down, you have, you have 10, 20 people with nothing to do. You can't switch them to another line. So um, that's, that's the difference. When we, when we bring in this new machinery, we'll, have, we'll be back to 30% spur capacity. And as we get towards 60 million, we'll probably invest in more machines. But um, that, that, that's the reason, and uh, I think that's, that's why we're confident we can improve the margin when we bring this machinery in. It will take, there is a disruptive factor in there, and we may have to go outside and do more manufacturing outside for a short period of time, but it will be worth it. There yeah, are Bruce? anticipated to be some labour cost reductions in these, but it's not the main driver. The main driver is to boost the capacity. Two questions. Um, you've talked a bit about overseas in terms of Germany, um, but not in other terms of other geographic regions, and also um, separate area. When you lose out on bids um, to manufacture or produce product for people, who do you lose out to and why? I'd, can we take a second question? Yeah. We hardly ever lose out. <laughs> That's an easy one. Often when we lose out, I didn't want it anyway, if I'm honest. Yeah. Because we get undercut, you get undercut, and I look at it and go, I didn't want that anyway. Let them do it, it'll come back. And I've had something recently that's come back because a manufacturer took it, couldn't deliver to the retailer, lo and behold, it's back for five, six pence difference. So often when we lose it, it's, it's, they're undercutting on price, and honestly, we'll just go, it's fine. <laughs> it's all about the it's quality and the service. And there's not a really good competitor in the market at the minute. There's a lot of people aspiring to it, and a lot of people on LinkedIn telling us what they're doing in terms of investing in new machinery and doubling their capacity, but they're not in the they're not real competitors yet. And the first part of the question, the oh, overseas, yeah. the overseas <laughs> markets. Um, actually, the one I didn't mention, which is the one that actually we've, we've had some nice growth over the past six months, is the Middle East. Um, we've launched, we're doing private label for Saudi Arabia, which is very interesting. There's a chain of, um, they're the equivalent of boots in Saudi Arabia. They've got 1,200 pharmacies. They're called Nadi. We're doing private label for them because Saudi Arabia doesn't have the infrastructure to produce these kind of products. That's going very well. But we've just launched six of our brands with the same retailer in Saudi. We've just gone into life pharmacies in um, Dubai and the UAE, so that's quite exciting as well. So the Middle East is moving. Um, Russia continues to do very well from us, and Turkey is just going from strength to strength, which was one of our first export markets. We're direct to retail in Turkey. And in fact, the thing I also didn't mention is our, our market is evolving in export. We start most models with distributors, and as soon as that market matures for us a little bit and doors have been opened, we start to go direct. So Australia, we've just, start, we've just opened our own business in Australia. We've employed a country manager down there. We're moving from the distributor that we've been with for about four years. We've outgrown them. They're, ju they're just not suited to our aspirations in terms of what we want to do. Um, and so we're moving Australia into a direct model in terms of what we're doing. Um, Turkey happens to be a direct model as well. Um, so that's our goal with most export markets. Distributors are good at opening those markets, but we often find they're not the best at managing your brands always and getting hands on and getting close to the retailer and close to the consumer um, is where we want to be. So yeah, Middle East and Aust Australia will be interesting over the next 12 months. I think the, di the dynamics changing there which is good. Um, six months ago, I asked you uh, about Brexit. Can I ask you about Brexit again? And uh, your updated <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, I mentioned uh, that we weren't really dependent on the EU in terms of sales because we, we, we sell very little. Germany is a target market. It's a great market. It, we should be, we should in the longer term be very successful in Germany. So um, where it's going to impact us is in the buying side um i think we can cope with it i can't see any really major issues what, what kind of thing were you I think thinking? last time you, you talked about employment as well employees oh, employees, employees yeah we do employ quite a number of <coughs> europeans um i think that's settled down a bit um we don't see any shortage in the market of what, what we are short of is is really home qualified or good engineers that will work a shift system we can find any number of people that work all hours of the day and night, you know, from Eastern Europe or uh, other places in the world. The real, the real issue for us 
No, and it's getting off the track from your question, but the real issue for us is getting high quality engineers. And, and we've just recruited our first uh, Macedonian engineer who, who seems to be uh, very well able to do this job. But um, that, that's our real issue. I can't see that Brexit will, will depends how it works out, of course. Uh, if it stopped all immigration and you had to send all the Polish people home, we, we would be decimated, you know. There's obviously been a bit of a... But we still import quite a bit from Europe. We still have a Euro exposure on the buying side. Um, the majority of our tubes come in from Europe. Um, the 27-mile traffic jam the other side of the Channel <coughs> Tunnel would be an operational issue that we'd have to manage and deal with. But, but those are things, you know, it just becomes part of managing the business. It, it, it's, it's a change in circumstances we have to manage. Yeah. You mentioned that Aldi were onshoring mm. their yes, production. Yes. Is that something that you're going to do as well? Are you looking to... Go the other one? No, bring products. Tubes is a good example. We get our best price and best quality tubes from Eastern Europe. would want to continue doing that. There's nobody in the UK doing what they do. But what we have done with tubes, if we've got, we, if you like, we've got a, a, a plan B, which is I can buy laminate tubes that have that lovely finish. They're not quite as nice as what we're buying for, but there's a plan B should I need to go and get. So we're trying to where we can put second sources of supply that are UK based. They might be slightly more expensive, they not, might not be quite what we want, but it in, ensures continuity of supply. And obviously for something like our brands, we can make those decisions and decide what we want to do. So that there is a certain amount of that going on as well. Brexit's such a variable, I mean, it's impossible to, to, to really nail it. But we're fairly flexible and resourceful. Yeah, just one last question. I mean, uh, this is industry is a very highly profitable industry. It's one of the best consumer industries to get into in the world. Yet your margins are only six, seven percent. Aren't they? Aren't your aspirations a little bit low on that? I mean, you know, what? Unilever are making maybe twenty percent on their on on their uh, their their uh, hair care and, uh, and beauty area, and they're spending, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty percent of revenue on marketing. So the margins are very, very high. And I know you're, you're competing on price, but I just wondered, you know, aren't your aspirations a little bit low? Couldn't you be well, making 10 percent to, to, to come from the and be and, and, and compete with a premium hair care product. Mm. So we went the other way, and particularly in, way back in 2007, we decided to go for that value market and build Crichton's name in the value market, particularly in hair care, which we now have spread out to skin care and tanning and body care and all the rest of it but i i don't think it's a, it's possible to get in there at the top we we're in at the bottom and working our way to the top we're about to launch a hair care brand which will have a premium element to it which i don't think we can discuss at the moment can we okay, okay. but we recognize the issue i don't think you can start and you can start at the top and work i think in our case we've chosen to start at the bottom and work up and i think it's it's working for us I'll leave it oh. to you to wind. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Everybody, it's lovely to see you. We've enjoyed it. We love coming and talking to you. We love doing what we do. We love competing. Um, we love it if the share price would double as well, but that's, that's another thing. So thank you very much. Um, hope to see you all again soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.